And Lord, I thank you again. I thank you for everybody here right now and for all the people in this congregation. Thank you that you call us together. Thank you especially that you call us to meet around your holy word and that you promise your Holy Spirit with us. So do bless us now as we explore together uh, these very central chapters in 1 Corinthians today that we may find things that are really helpful for our lives and for our time, for your people and for your kingdom today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our list of questions uh, of uh, that which is being dealt with in chapter 7 particularly, you get a, a sense of some of the questions that were raised in this wild open place, wide open and wild uh, called Corinth, as Christians tried to understand what it was like to live in a society like that, and all kinds of questions came up, and all kinds of pressures, as we're going to see today. And one of them has to do with the whole business of marriage. Is marriage okay? Because you had a certain amount of, quote unquote, very spiritually minded people who said, well, a, a true believer would rise above that. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't have such things as marriage. You know, go off to the monastery or what have you. And then others, as we've said many, many times, of the very prevailing opinion in Corinth, which was so wild, uh, just basically felt, hey, the sky's the limit. Anything can go physically. Don't be bound to one woman and so forth. So in this kind of uh, tearing apart of the different possibilities, what do you do about marriage? And as we're going to see in just a moment, it was a difficult time. Something was going on, probably persecution, but a very difficult time. And so, picking up at verse 25 in chapter 7, about virgins, and very light, this is a long story, and I decided I'm just not going to go into much in terms of detail on this because it gets so complicated. Very likely what this is, and also uh, a, one of the longer paragraphs coming up after this in a little ways, is very likely a situation of uh, young marriageable daughters where literally the, the father or the guardian of that daughter has a great deal to say. We've got to remember this is not contemporary in, the, in the, this sense that at that time most marriages were arranged. And uh, as a matter of fact, that happened through most of history. And by the way, most marriages were probably about as successful as they are today, even under that quote unquote arrangement. So what about these young women? I have no command from the Lord. Now, wait a minute. What, what, what does this mean then for the word of God? Well, we had a similar situation last week, and we made that distinction between Paul sometimes being able to quote direct words from Jesus that were floating around in the early church. And so if you read, though I think dates have been moved up quite a bit in the eyes of many scholars these days, but if you read something like, well, the first gospel wasn't written until 70 or 80 or 90 even, first of all, I think we can move those up. But uh, keep in mind that even if that's the case, as I've tried to say a number of times, statements about Jesus and statements of Jesus were in wide currency in the early church. People were able to have checks and balances. Luke, if you're interested in this subject, Luke 1, 1 to 4 tells you a lot about how much was going on in the early church in terms of what was known about Jesus and what he said. So Paul here, when he says, I have no command from the Lord, simply means I don't have a direct statement that Jesus ever uh, made about this particular situation. But I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. You can take this to heart. You can believe me. You can know that this is directed by God. And then I think a very crucial phrase in trying to figure out, and quite frankly, these I find to be the most difficult chapters in Corinthians. And as I look at various commentaries, I'm not the only one who feels that way. But because, this is very important though to help sort it out. Because of the present crisis. Something is going on because of the present crisis, and it's a very strong word. That me, and present means, some people say, well, he's just talking about the second coming. No, crisis doesn't appear, that particular Greek word doesn't appear in the discussions of the second coming. It's something that's pressing and distressing, and especially it's in the here and now. When I looked at uh, the Greek word present, in present crisis, and I looked at that more closely, it definitely has the connotation I discovered 
of something here right now. It's already arrived. Something's going on. Life is not easy for Christians in Corinth. Remember, Paul was going to be martyred within about 10 years of this. He's writing this in 55, and he probably was not living more than another 10 years. And in Corinth itself, there must have been a terrific backlash against Christians. Because of the present crisis, I think that it's good for you to remain as you are. You know, the more I got to think about this, and how do I translate this into our time? Let me try something. See if this fits, maybe. God forbid, but if you were living in Ukraine right now, would this be a time to set up a wedding? Hey, we're going to have... I have a, a big church wedding in downtown Kiev and so forth and set it up for three weeks from Saturday. I mean, quite seriously. Uh, it, there, there just are, are times when, hey, some things really, really do need to wait because of this crisis. Again, you can try that on for size. It may or may not fit, but it did strike me as being something that would give us kind of a gut feeling of how you don't always want to make significant moves especially, let's say, somebody's going to have a big wedding and wants to celebrate and invite people in from out of town, this is probably, quite seriously, not the time. And so because of the present crisis, it's good. And again, as I mentioned last week, that doesn't mean it's superior or morally better or uh, totally preferable, but it's okay. I, I just prefer to use the word okay. For you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. It just may not be the time because something's going on and Christians are under the gun and families even uh, may be threatened with various kinds of persecution as so often is happening, by the way, in our world today. I read such sad stuff from an organization uh, that I'm a little bit involved with or contribute to, Open Doors, uh, every morning. The things that in their prayer request pamphlet the things going on in, in uh, uh, the lives of Christians today are really something. And families are being torn apart and persecuted. So you've got to realize, Paul is saying very realistically, there are concerns if you get married. But, now look at this, this shows the flexibility here. If you do marry, you have not sinned. In other words, there's, there's certain circumstances where it's okay. Real quick reference to a movie that had come to mind is way back in the 1950s, but I played it again this week to be sure I remember this part correctly. On Peter Marshall, remember, uh, does some of you ever see that movie, A Man Called Peter? I look back, by the way, I can hardly believe that Hollywood once put out a movie like that that actually featured a minister in a favorable light, honestly. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 it really, truly is. Anyway, uh, when Marshall gets his major call to a very well-established old church in Washington, as a matter of fact, where Abraham Lincoln is said to have kind of sneaked into the balcony and, and worshipped very frequently. Uh, there's a scene where one of the women who's very upset with this young Peter Marshall, because he's bringing in all these young people, and they had this Saturday night canteen. This is during World War II, so it was a time of crisis. And they've got these soldiers here. What really put it over the edge for her was when she went up to a room, it's called the Lincoln Room, she opens the door, and here's this young couple embracing, sitting on a couch. And that, she is so mad, and she goes to Peter Marshall that night, and he says, they were just married tonight at 7 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, he has to ship out. He's in the, in the military. They've got exactly two hours. And it just touches your life. And, and I thought of that to try to give some kind of relatively contemporary example for Paul, what Paul is saying here, I don't know the circumstances at all of that particular couple, but for various reasons that did seem good for them to do that, and Paul says, don't blame them. They have not sinned. If a virgin marries, uh, she has not sinned, but though, boy, look at this, those who marry will face many troubles in this life. You know, <laughs> you know I've, I've been in the ministry a long time, I have officiated at a lot of weddings. A lot of people have asked for a reading from 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. I've never had anybody <laughs> request. I mean, can you imagine, you know, with a big wedding and I say something like, and now a reading from 1 Corinthians 7. Those who marry will face many troubles in this life. 
And so, bride and groom, you are to be commended for your courage in getting, <laughs> in getting into this mess. Realism here, flexibility, this is the opposite of legalism. Have you noticed that? He just doesn't say, I'm making a law, blah, blah, blah. He never says that. Notice the flexibility. He realizes there are different circumstances, and particularly if he is talking about persecution in Corinth, that would be a reason that if they go after families, you know, that was one of the strategies that at times the Nazis used. It was one thing for one person to be courageous and to hold off and, and, and not to uh, give in and tell what the Nazis wanted to hear and so forth, but if his family was threatened to be tortured or whatever, murdered even, that would give you pause. And so that's, a, as I said, that's going on today in many countries. Now, as a part of the, the larger picture here, and this does fit in with our age, even though we're not an age that tends to think very much about eternity, I would say that verses uh, 29 through 31, I've got it labeled here, Christian's view of the world. It's kind of a, a general reflection on the way Christians can look at the world that really does not have the permanency that we like to think it does. And here again in 29, a lot of people jump on this and say, well, the time is short. See, he's just talking about the second coming, you know, what if it comes next week or next month? No, he's talking in general about the fact that keep in mind, whatever you decide, folks, about getting married or not getting married, this life is not all there is, and it's absolutely just a snap of the finger compared to eternity. As I say, we don't tend to do, you know, what are the things that really made us happy last week? Did it, did it have to do with eternity or something that was nice, you know, right in the here and now? And that, I think, begins to open up some avenues of interpretation in some strange lines. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none? He's obviously not talking about, you know, free, uh, quote-unquote, open marriage and so forth, and you don't need to be bound. No, he's obviously not meaning that, and look how he goes on. Those who mourn as if they did not, huh? Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who have something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. Would somebody look up, please, Luke 6, 21 to 25? This is very important. Luke chapter 6, 21 to 25, because these are the words in, in, in Luke from Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Plain, which is very similar to the Sermon on the Mount. So the point is, this is not just some idea Paul has. He's not quoting Jesus directly, but he knows that Jesus had a hang-loose attitude in some ways toward the world as, as well. So somebody had that to shout out for us? Yeah, thank you. Get the sense of this shortness. Okay, you're laughing now, but if you think you've got it made and, and you've triumphed over everybody else, you're going to mourn and weep. And, and all of this, I mean, it, it seems strange in a way, if you really want to unpack every single one of those lines, Jesus is saying, remember, this is not all there is. The form of this world is, is the way, Paul, or that's, that's one of the translations, the world in this present form is passing away. And yet so often we fight that and fight that, maybe especially in our very prosperous times where we are so blessed with material things, almost all of us compared to, certainly compared to most societies ever and, and even most people in the world today. And we just, just somehow don't let go. Maybe you've heard the, the one about the, the, the man who was very wealthy and he was just so proud of all his wealth. And when he realized he was dying, he was just really mad, kind of mad at the universe or mad at God. And he said, you know, they say you can't take it with you, but I'm going to take it with me. And so as he was dying and knew it, he asked his wife to promise. She, he said, I want you to take all of my 
wealth, all of my money, and place it in my casket when I am buried. And the woman, there was something touching about the situation, well, for whatever reason, she promised she would. At the funeral, right before the funeral directors closed the casket, this woman walked up to the casket and put in a box about the size of a shoebox. And then they shut the casket and took it out for burial. And later, a close friend of this widow in whom she had confided was just shocked. She said, you didn't really do that. You didn't really give him all his wealth to put in a casket. The woman said, I promised. Oh, come on, you didn't really. How could you do something like that? And the woman said, well, you know what was in that box? I wrote him a check for the whole amount. <laughs> So we fight for all we're worth against the idea that this world is passing away and that we really can't take it with us. And then look at, uh, look at Paul's motivation. I would like you to be free from concern. Now, that doesn't mean carefree in every way. Uh, he knows that there are blessings. Of, Paul himself talked about his anxiety for the churches. Uh, there are concerns we want to take on. But, and this may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but he knows that there are some uh, you know, concerns that anybody would uh, have in terms of marriage and family, which he should have. An unmarried man, though, you know, if somebody does not feel called to marriage and is fine with celibacy, uh, an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please, oh, if only that were always the case, <laughs> how, how he can please his wife. You've probably heard the, the old saying, Marriage is finding that one special person whom you can annoy for the rest of your life. <laughs> but Paul, again, is, is putting the best construction on marriage here. And very rightly, you need to be concerned about your family and so forth. And in that sense, one's interests are, are going to be divided. I mean, you cannot put the, the number of hours in to, you know, the way people in, in monasteries, for example, could. But on, Unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord. Paul constantly, I pointed out several times last week, balances male and female here, which was pretty unusual for the time. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit, but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. Again, here's the, the uniformity here or the polarity, the mutuality, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, not to lay down the law, but so that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. In other words, the point is, in what way in your life can you best serve the Lord? And, and just so you know for sure where I say, uh, most of you know my, my wife died 18 years ago, but I was so blessed to be married uh, to her for 38 years, and, and, and she was just such an incredible blessing, quite frankly, in terms of my ministry. I mean, I honestly believe I could serve God much better with somebody like Marianne at, at my side. And I, I thank God every day for that relationship that we had. So please understand. But Paul is very loose here in, in the sense that you've got to look as to in what way do you honestly feel you will best be able to serve God. So that's the meaning of this last uh, part here in verse 35, living in undivided devotion to the Lord. Doesn't mean you uh, aren't devoted to someone else, but that you make sure the priority is always that of, of serving God. Now, this next one, we go on and on and on and on and on. I'm going to really, really cut this. There, there, this is what one commentary said. No view is without difficulties. But I lean to the view, and I'll explain very briefly why I do, that what's being talked about here. First of all, there's a terrible translation here. I, I love the NIV, but I don't know why they translated it this way. Here's the way they translated it, as I'm, I'm reading from my NIV version here. If anyone thinks he's acting improperly toward the virgin he is engaged to, it does not say engaged to in the Greek at all. It's strictly his virgin, parthenos, from which the word parthenon comes, by the way. And that is usually in this context, and where I, I would fall on this, is the father who is, or guardian, responsible for marrying off his, his daughters. And uh, 
uh, here the whole business is really addressed to a father or guardian. Again, I, as I said just a few minutes ago, so many marriages were arranged. If she's getting along in years, and by the way, that meant in that culture, if she's 20 years old already, uh, they tended to be, women tended to be younger vis-a-vis -vis men even than they, they are in later times. If she's getting along in years and he feels he ought to marry, but I'll try to be really, really brief on this. I see the time is really going, but there are two words for marry. One is, you know, if I, when I married Marianne, but I could also as a pastor say, you know, I married that couple over there about 20 years ago. I wonder how it sounds to people, by the way, if they'd ever overhear me with my loud voice say, you know that woman in that room? I married her 22 years ago. You know. <laughs> really? I thought you were married to Marianne at that time. <laughs> so it's the causative that is used here. That is to, to give someone in marriage. And I have a lengthy uh, alternative down at the bottom, which I won't take the time to read, but that totally goes along with this idea that we're talking here about the commonality of arranged marriages. And so we've got the two different words in Greek that are clearer. They both have the same root but they're clearly distinguished, whereas English does not distinguish between the causative, that which makes something happen, and that which one actually does. Marrying or officiating at a marriage or giving in marriage. But if, if, if the, the man feels, hey, my daughter really should be married, yeah, go ahead. That's probably good. He's not sinning. They, and that's not the, the obviously not the guardian and the, and the, the daughter, but uh, here I think it's just a plural form. I struggled over this a little bit looking at the Greek more tightly, but I think there is simply uh, a meaning in terms of the plurality that young virgins like this uh, uh, should be, young, young marriageable daughters uh, could get uh, and should get married then. But the man who settled the matter in his own mind, who's under no compulsion but has control over his own will and has made up his mind not to give his daughter in marriage, this man also does the right thing. In other words, there are different circumstances. We've got flexibility here. Again, the very opposite of legalism. This is not Paul the crab coming in and telling people, you do this, you do that, but rather this flexibility under God. How can you best serve God? How can your daughter best be a child of God? So this man also does the right thing. That's really, I find that very comforting. We do have to, as human beings, make decisions about different circumstances, uh, is, is it good to get married now? Should I wait? Should I not get married? God entrusts us with that. So look at this then. He who marries, in other words, who marries off the virgin, does right, but he who does not marry, who does not give her in marriage, does even better. And then a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she, she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. And we're going to run to that later on too. Uh, the business about not being unequally yoked, I mean, that Paul has in his uh, various writings. In my judgment, in that case, she may be happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God, and I know that I, too, am going to drink a cup of coffee right now. <laughs> okay, let's go on to, we're on to chapter 8 here. <laughs> A very short chapter, and that's why I decided to split things the way I do today. Again, another issue that in its immediate particular doesn't really pertain to our society, and yet it's got some of the most important principles. And so uh, I challenge all of us, including myself, uh, to, to see where does this hit the road in, in terms of our own particular society. And I think there are a number of places. But obviously the business of sacrificing food to, to idols was uh, something that, fortunately, at least with maybe a few exceptions these days, is pretty much a thing of the past, but very crucial in a place like Corinth where there was so much idolatry that if you went to the meat market, just an ordinary butcher shop, and wanted to buy some meat, you could never be sure at all whether it had or had not been sacrificed to idols because when you went to a temple and sacrificed, only a small portion of it would be consumed on the altar, and then the priests would always, or nearly always, eat a lot of it, and then the remaining uh, material, the remaining meat, would go to a butcher and be sold on the open market. I'm told that in Spain, there are butcher trucks waiting outside of, uh, of bullfight arenas 
uh, and, and uh, immediately uh, to transport things off. Well, here, again, you could never know. Now, if you went, and sometimes this comes up in other places, if you specifically went to an idol feast in, uh, in maybe in or near a temple, you know, that would be different, or friends of yours had that. It, it gets very complicated, and again, rather than go in and try to totally unpack what's going on in the Corinth of 55 AD, try to keep in mind those things, be, which I think I'll wait until I point out some of the principles here and we can draw the analogies then. But first of all, what was being said, and uh, my uh, footnote here does indicate that this first statement, we know that all possess knowledge, was said by some. Matter of fact, my particular footnote here says, we all possess knowledge as you say, and that's in quotation marks. This is the, you know, you've heard me mention the Gnostics so many times. It's that idea of kind of spiritualizing or intellectualizing religion and separating it from the physical and saying, look, we know that th this is not real. The idols are not real. We've got that knowledge. We can go ahead and do anything. We can do anything we want with the physical world, including uh, the meat that may have technically been sacrificed to idols. So we know that we all possess knowledge. And now Paul is not afraid to hit at one of the main idols, so to speak, in quotations, of that and many societies, namely the elitism of knowledge. What does Paul say in a culture that so highly prizes philosophical knowledge? Knowledge puffs up. And then look at that wonderful contrast as he introduces the more important item by far in the Christian life. Love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. We've had that word before for pridefulness or arrogance. Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Keep that in mind. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. Uh, keep that in mind. You know, who are the, the know-it-alls that, that you know in your life? And how much do they really know? I'm going to quote from you something that came out in the... Uh, Times Call in the TC line, if I can find where, find where I put it here, just, just two days ago. So you know this, this is really it. I'm going right to the, the source. But it was interesting that on Friday, people who believe they're smarter than everyone else are usually too dense to understand their ignorance. That, that's really not bad, is it? You know, it seems to me it, it is true that there's nobody who knows less than the person who knows it all. You know, stop and think about that. That kind of overlooking the ignorance. You know, somebody has said 51% of being smart is knowing what you're dumb at. And I, and I must say, my, one of my absolute all-time favorite non-biblical slash secular statements, I, I find myself thinking of it at least once a week, is from Will Rogers, who said, we are all ignorant only in different subjects. I mean, if you think about that, <laughs> I could tell you thousands of subjects I'm ignorant of, and stop and think the most brilliant people maybe are, for sure, not just maybe, totally ignorant. Albert Einstein says a good argument for equality is that, that the difference between the most learned and the least learned person is nothing compared to that vast part of the universe that we don't know anything about. So Paul is taking a little slap here. He's willing to do it in this culture that, again, I use the word advisedly, idolizes knowledge. The man who thinks he knows, that's the one who certainly doesn't know much. And then, notice the twist in this next section. The man who loves God doesn't say, therefore, knows God, but knows that he is, or maybe doesn't even know, but is known by God. God knows him. That's what really counts. Not how much we know vis-a-vis -vis the vast sphere of the unknown. But God, if he knows us, knows us primarily through love. I mean, it's a major thing that Christianity brought on the scene. I don't recall anything in ancient Greek philosophy quite like that, that lifts up this, and I won't go into it now, but you know there are different Greek words for love, and this is the, the highest word for love. That's what really counts. That's going to count very much in terms of his ethic here. So then, with that in mind, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know, 
that is, those of us who are in the know do know about this, those of us who are in Christ, that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. Yeah, we know there's only one God. We know idols aren't real. But then he says, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are huh, many gods and many lords, it's nicely put in quotes in my English version, but quotations don't appear in the Greek. What's he talking about here? Because he said, we know there are many gods and lords, but for us there is but one. Well, is this just relativism? No, he means what Luther picked up on later in his uh, large catechism. You could probably mostly read this, but I'll read it real quickly if some of you can't. A god is the term for that to which we are to look for all good and in which we are to find refuge in all need. To have a god is nothing else than to trust and believe in that one with your whole heart. It is the trust and faith of the heart alone that make both God and an idol. If your faith and trust are right, then your God is the true one. Conversely, where your trust is false and wrong, in the wrong object, in other words, there you do not have the true God, for these two belong together, faith and God. Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. You know, so, and so we can speak of the God of material things. Uh, we can speak of, I think, the most, uh, you've heard me say this before, the perennial false god from Adam and Eve on is the god of the self. Boy, if you want to see an idol, it's my life, I know what to do with it. You're not looking for Paul's advice, for biblical advice on marriage or anything else. It's mine. Or if instead of owning things, things own us, they can become our gods. If we use that which we should love, as Augustine put it, if we sin is basically using what we should love and loving what we should merely use, we do need to have a little hanging loose with the things of this earth. But we know that there is only one God, he goes on to say, the Father, from whom all things came and through whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Notice the absolute equality of God the Father and Jesus Christ. But... Contrary to verse 1, not everybody knows this. Not everybody, even within the Christian church, he's saying, can absorb this fully anyway, really knows it on the, on the gut level, the, the knowledge that really comes from the heart and the depths of one's being. He explains, some people are still so accustomed to idols, they've grown up with them all their life, that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol and since their conscience is weak, weak means not informed by Christian knowledge and also being bound to the past, not being able to accept yet the gospel of Jesus Christ and its implications in the, in the full. So their conscience in that sense is weak. It's not well formed. Conscience is not God because conscience can be very, very false. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. That's important to keep in mind. I have a little illustration of that here. And uh, I'm curious, by the way, this is an aside. I shouldn't do it, but I'll explain why. Do those two guys remind you of anybody? Laurel and Hardy. Laurel and Hardy. Ah. Public confession. They're my all-time favorite. <laughs> you, you can tell I have a suave, sophisticated sense of humor. <laughs> I have more Laurel and Hardy DVDs than anybody else combined. Theologians, you name it. I've got more. I got about 20 hours worth. And I have made the saintly, I just want you to know, then I'll move on. I have made the saintly pilgrimage of a lifetime to Stan Laurel's boyhood home in Overston, England. I was there. So, anyway. <laughs> anyway, food isn't going to be the answer, though. Be careful, however. And this is where I think we really get into what we can very much take to heart these days. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom, you've got a freedom in Christ here. You do know some things if you know Jesus Christ and that he is the only God. But don't let that become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? I'll give you a completely different kind of analogy, but I think one we can all understand. 
it's fine for most of us to drink a glass of wine, but what if we're sitting at a, a table and there are several of us and uh, you know, we're all thinking of having a glass of wine, but one of the persons sitting at the table has been fighting a really hard battle to overcome alcoholism. And if that person sees the rest of us indulge, there may be a really falling off the, a real falling off the wagon. I mean, that's an analogy I think we could, uh, many of us uh, grasp and understand. There are certain things that might be perfectly fine for some, but if you take love into the picture, and what Paul is going to say about the Christian ethic, we have another consideration than simply our own desire. Be very careful. That, and, you know, we exalt personal freedom. Uh, in my personal life, at least, I should get to do whatever I want. No, be careful lest that be a stumbling block to the weak. And then as I just read, for if anyone with a weak conscience sees you eating idol meat, won't he be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols, has been sacrificed? So this weak brother for whom Christ died, that's how you look at this person, not somebody where you say, well, I'm going to show you that I can do this and I'm enlightened and I have the knowledge and you just watch me, I'll just go in and take this meat that you say has been offered to an idol. I don't believe in idols, just watch me. No. If you do that, you can really, really hurt your brother. And it's, again, the idea that this isn't just a spectator over against with whom I want to show my sophistication and knowledge and faith. This is my brother or sister for whom Jesus Christ has died. You get a sense here of the real, even though the specific issue doesn't directly concern us, a sense for a new foundation of ethical living a new way of looking at things, not just the knowledge that puffs me up. I know that this is fine, so I'm going to do it. But the love that builds up somebody else. You don't want this weak brother, 11, for whom Christ died, to be destroyed by your knowledge. And that may mean really uh, basically fall away from the faith even. could be pretty powerful. At the very least, you're encouraging them to do something that's strongly against their conscience, they may not have the sense of the forgiveness of Christ yet, the grace of Christ. They may be very much at a rudimentary stage in Christian knowledge. You're destroying them. You're blowing them out of the water in terms of their faith and their relationship with your people in the church. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. That comes up a lot, doesn't it? Uh, Paul, uh, when he was on the road to Damascus and met Jesus, was asked by Jesus, Saul, why do you persecute me? He didn't say, why do you persecute my church? Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Or tells us in Matthew 25, inasmuch as you have not done it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you haven't done it to me. And so Christ's identity is such that you directly sin against you. It's a powerful identity of Christ and his people, Christ and his church. We, we need a lot of faith to understand, wow, he really, really, really does care about what we do to his people. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. Notice that very, for lack of a better word, altruistic, but I prefer to call it you know, Christ, really Christ-centered, love-centered, in the biblical sense of the word love, ethic. What matters is not what's right for me, and I own my own body and my own life, and I can call the shots. No, I need to think about my brother and sister and what that means potentially for him or her. Questions or comments on this? Yeah. In uh, chapter 7, verse 29, Paul makes reference to time being Today we say that we've been in the end times since yeah. Christ was born. And a uh, thousand years may be the blink of an eye to God. But isn't it highly likely that at this point in Christianity's history, they thought that the second coming was right around the corner? Some did, but I don't want to, that's been stressed so much that there, there are reasons uh, linguistically and et cetera 
why I don't tend to see it that way anymore in this passage. But, but I admit, the one that looks like it points to that most is the one you've pointed out, and I'm glad you did. I meant to emphasize that even more. But I think I did say the thing about, you know, compared to eternity, what Paul is saying is way the long haul here against this relatively short time. And, and I really don't think, based again on the fact of what this word, I'm going a lot by the Greek phrase for present crisis, because as I said, when I studied the, the verb form more, I realized it's here. This is not something that may happen tomorrow. It's, it's here right now. And so I think the primary reference is that life is always short, whether Jesus comes in the next hour or whether our own life, even if it ends you know, several decades from now, that's still short. And for most of us, it's gonna be a lot less than second, uh, several decades. So I, I, I think it fits better in the total context. And then that's why I had us you know, read the passage uh, where Jesus on the Sermon on the Plain uh, talks about the fact that you may be weeping now, but you will rejoice. And those who have put their trust in riches now are soon going to have that overturned, soon in, in relation to eternity. I mean, we're not even one nanosecond of eternity. Well, Jesus says that uh, even the angels don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I... I I, I really don't, I, I think that's been read into it. It was popular for various reasons in terms of theological development at certain times in Christian history, fairly recent times, recent centuries anyway. But I, I don't, the more I looked at it, I thought I, I'm going to pretty well eliminate that. It's possible. And it's maybe a dimension behind that. I'm sure it's a dimension behind that, that Jesus is going to come someday. And so remember, uh, what, whatever you do in this life, we have to be answerable to him. So I'm certainly not reading that out of the picture. He's definitely coming again. But as you just said, even the angels don't know when. Other questions? Yeah. You know, it's a good point. What do you do to make a person stumble? Example is very powerful. And I have to, I really had to preach to myself when I looked at this because I thought with, with my general mentality, what I would be tempted to say is, okay, now in our church in Corinth, let's have a session here on the theological meaning of idols and what that leads to and blah, blah, blah. But love is far more powerful than a lecture. And if we do not show love, uh, a person is, is going to stumble. Yeah, yeah. And you know, if you don't know it, that's different. Yeah. Like somebody at their, for dinner, and you decide to have a wine, knowing that he's going to recover, he's going to have to work, and then you present him a wine, then you sin. Yeah. Good, good point, Ewald. Okay, I'd like us to wrestle with this then, as we do at tables, and just some suggestions, obviously go whatever direction <laughs> you want. Again, I think you can all see that, but... Uh, teachings that you think are, are most significant to remember, uh, principles that you, you want to remember, especially when it comes to honest disagreements uh, among Christians today, and uh, are there any things that are kind of hard for you to either understand or to accept? Let's uh, throw that one around in the 10 or 12 minutes we have left, please.
Okay, thank you for batting that around and I look forward to seeing you next week. Two, can you believe it? Two weeks from today will be Easter, so we won't meet here on, on Easter for obvious reasons, but uh, I, I do look forward to seeing you and thanks for being part of us here. Let's uh, close with prayer. Lord, thank you that your word, even when it appears in societies somewhat different from the original setting, packs a mighty punch for us, O oh God, and a beautiful, beautiful word of grace. Lord, again, we pray that we would, as always, that we would take to heart what you have for us today and live it and exalt and praise you and glorify you as a result of that. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>